Hi, I'm Dr. Craig Chepke, Adjunct Associate Professor of Psychiatry for Atrium Health and Medical Director of Excel Psychiatric Associates in Huntersville, North Carolina. Today, on behalf of Teva, I'll talk about the importance of differentiating tardive dyskinesia, or TD, and drug-induced Parkinsonism, or DIP. The American Psychiatric Association, or APA, and the DSM-5-TR provide distinct treatment recommendations for TD and DIP. But there is a disconnect between the guidelines and how patients are being managed in the real world. Data indicate that anticholinergics are being used to treat TD, but this is not an effective treatment strategy and can have a number of detrimental consequences for patients. Approximately one-third of patients taking antipsychotic drugs, or APDs, will experience TD, DIP, or both. In the past, TD and DIP were both described by the term EPS, or extrapyramidal symptoms, and as such, patients with both disorders were managed with anticholinergics. However, the concept of EPS is outdated. We now understand that TD and DIP have different underlying causes, opposite clinical presentations, and therefore very different treatments. Unfortunately, the concept of EPS is so well entrenched in psychiatry and many providers still don't recognize that TD is distinct from DIP. It's critical to differentiate patients with TD from patients with DIP because treatment for one disorder may exacerbate the other disorder. The APA practice guideline for the treatment of schizophrenia and the DSM-5-TR guidelines provide guidance for the treatment of each disorder, as well as several precautions that should be made when considering anticholinergic medications. VMAT2 inhibitors, which are approved for TD, are recommended if symptoms have an impact on the patient. In contrast, symptoms of TD tend to be worsened by anticholinergic medications such as benzodiazepine. Anticholinergics are indicated for the treatment of DIP. However, their use has been linked to impaired quality of life, impaired cognition, and significant health complications. Guidelines recommend considering the anticholinergic burden before prescribing a medication in this class. Many medications have anticholinergic properties, and for this reason, anticholinergics are not typically administered prophylactically when starting an antipsychotic. If an anticholinergic is used, it should be adjusted to the lowest dose possible for the shortest time necessary. Despite the recommendations regarding the use of anticholinergics, a survey of providers indicated that fewer than 40% are familiar with the 2020 APA practice guideline for the treatment of schizophrenia. In the United States, TD affects approximately 785,000 patients. However, only about 15% of these patients have received a formal diagnosis, and less than 6% have been treated with a VMAT2 inhibitor. So this leaves as many as 85% of patients with TD either being missed or possibly misdiagnosed with DIP. In addition, approximately 40% of psychiatric providers stated they use benzodiazepine to prevent or treat TD. In a separate analysis of patients who were diagnosed with TD, 36% were receiving benzodiazepine. Additional analyses from the same dataset indicated that of those patients with TD who were taking benzodiazepine, about 75% of them remained on treatment for over three months and 35% were treated for over a year. Training and education to reduce use of benzodiazepine and TD is needed because clinical symptoms can be tied to the relative changes in dopamine signaling that can occur. I'll be reviewing the mechanisms underlying TD and DIP to explain why treating patients for TD with anticholinergics can worsen symptoms of TD. Recognizing the unique symptoms and neurobiology of both disorders may help clinicians align with the treatment guidelines. The time that it takes for symptoms of these disorders to present after use of antipsychotic drugs differs along with their clinical presentations. Parkinsonian symptoms generally begin within a few weeks to a few months of starting or increasing the dosage of an antipsychotic drug. DIP occurs due to an acute blockade of dopamine receptors, which leads to a reduction in postsynaptic dopamine signaling. On the other hand, in TD, the chronic blockade of dopamine D2 receptors by antipsychotics results in an upregulation and hypersensitivity of dopamine receptors. As such, TD develops after using an antipsychotic drug for at least a few months, but more typically over a few years. By DSM-5-TR criteria, a diagnosis of TD requires at least three months of exposure to antipsychotics for adults, but as little as one month for elderly patients. The symptoms of DIP are correlated with a decrease in dopamine signaling, whereas the symptoms of TD are correlated with a relative increase in dopamine signaling. We generally see reduced movement in patients with DIP versus excessive movement in TD. DIP is characterized by a paucity or slowness of movement. The person in this video demonstrates a masked face consistent with DIP. She appears to be staring and rarely blinks. 
In contrast, a person with TD has movements that are excessive and often continuous. This patient has an increased rate of blinking. Instead of a frozen look, she's puckering her lips repeatedly. The nature of the movements, whether hyperkinetic or hypokinetic, is one of the most important features to help me differentiate TD from DIP. While DIP is generally associated with a paucity of movement, patients with DIP may sometimes have a tremor. However, the nature of that tremor is different from the movements of TD. This patient has a Parkinsonian tremor in his left hand, which occurs in a predictable and rhythmic fashion. In contrast, the movements of TD are unpredictable, irregular, and sometimes even jerky. This patient has frequent involuntary movements, especially notable in his fingers and toes. Evaluating the patient's muscle tone is also helpful in differentiating TD from DIP. DIP may be accompanied by rigidity that can be felt and confirmed in a physical exam. In contrast, patients with TD have normal muscle tone. Discontinuing the APD may improve or resolve the symptoms associated with DIP, but if left untreated, TD is typically persistent and irreversible. APD reduction or withdrawal may fail to improve the symptoms of TD or might even induce withdrawal dyskinesia in them. Based on the differences between TD and DIP, we must consider which treatment approach can best address the specific condition. Anticholinergics are indicated for the treatment of DIP. However, the guidelines and the label for benzerpine, which is a commonly used anticholinergic, warn that these agents do not alleviate the symptoms of TD, and in some cases may even aggravate them. VMAT2 inhibitors are recommended for adults with TD, but they do have the potential to worsen DIP. Contrary to recommendations made in treatment guidelines, anticholinergics are being overprescribed in patients with TD, and only a fraction of patients with TD are being treated with a VMAT2 inhibitor. The APA and DSM-5-TR guidelines reinforce that TD and DIP are two very different disorders with different proposed pathophysiologies. As such, it's critical that we make the right diagnosis so we can select the right treatment approaches for our patients. I hope this video has provided a helpful overview of these two disorders and will be useful in the clinical management of your patients.